Welcome to Island Watch, in our last show of Season 1. It's our season finale. Just like this year, our first season has flown by. Or, more accurately, sailed by. Hi, I'm Dave Zarg. And I'm Gemma Voss. And this week on Island Watch, we're doing things a little bit differently. All aboard, and let's get this party started. Here's some news. We're going to be taking a break for the holidays, but we'll be back with more great episodes in our new season starting January 2021. To get the year off to a rollicking start, we'll also have a special bonus episode in the beginning of January. Make sure you subscribe so that bonus episode comes straight to you without delay. And by subscribing, you won't ever miss any of our shows. Today, it's our season ender show, the Archipelago Special. An archipelago is a group of small islands scattered in a relatively close area, so we liked it for a title for a seasonal wrap-up show. This episode, we have lists, we have food, we have news, we have messages from multiple bottles. It's a cornucopia that's pouring over the edges of the good ship Island Watch like a marshmallowy froth spilling from the brim of your favorite mug. Okay, I'm kind of going through a major hot chocolate phase right now. Me too. It's a show full of treats and surprises, so sit right back and enjoy. By the way, if this is your first Island Watch episode ever, please wend your way back into our feed and listen to a regular episode. Listen to all of them to get a taste of what we do here regularly, because this special Archipelago episode is not quite the norm. It's a little different flavor this time around. Mm, maybe mint or a nice mocha? Are you back to the hot chocolate again? Yeah, I am I am back to the hot chocolates. Anyway, each show in our season is a unique treat, and we're really happy to share all of them with you. Now, on with today's show. This is the end of our first season of Island Watch, and we've sailed around the world, virtually, a few times, and we've learned a lot doing it. Yeah, we've learned about islands near and far, and we've learned how to create a podcast from the ground up, and we've even learned how to say things like, I like the cut of their jib, with very little ironic intent. Well, maybe not that last one. (laughs) But for each destination we visit, whether it's a movie or a TV show or a Find the Island location, we spend a good amount of time searching and reading, looking for the goods, the stuff that we want to share with you. And with each destination, inevitably, we come across so many more interesting stories than there's ever room to share on the show and on our website. It's like we're strolling along Research Beach, eyes peeled for flotsam, jetsam, and other relics. And we find so many treasures that we created this special archipelago segment called News of the World Beachcomber Edition. There's a lot to cover. So let's dive in. All right, our first story. How good a swimmer are you? Enough to make it, say, six and a half kilometers through the Atlantic Ocean in a storm? Because in this story, the swimmers made it that distance, about four miles, from North Carolina mainland to a 90-kilometer stretch of barrier islands called the Outer Banks. A mini tsunami may have buoyed things along, but the swimmers were also at risk of being swept right out to sea if they hadn't been able to make it to the islands first. Maybe you've got a picture in your head of a long-distance swimmer in cap and goggles, but you need to switch up that visual because these were cows. Yeah, I said cows. Or, as they have now been nicknamed, sea cows. And when folks found the cows on the island a couple of months after the storm and wanted to get them back to the owners, the cows were having none of it. It turns out if you're living the life on your own private island with lots to eat and drink, you're not always that happy when folks show up to rescue you. Speaking of private islands, there's a man in Ivory Coast who has collected over 700,000 pieces of plastic waste, everything from water bottles to beach sandals. 
and he's created his own island just off the coast of Abidjan, the economic center of the country. Eric Becker first built the Lille Flottante, or floating island, as his home, but he turned it into a hotel and a resort, complete with two swimming pools and a karaoke bar, all within a tidy 1,000 square meters. Tidy, eh? A garbage island in the Atlantic, and, you, and you're calling it tidy. Well, at least he's trying to do something constructive with waste, so we can commend him for that. You have to see it to believe it, and you can by checking out the link on our website at islandwatchpodcast.com. We'll actually have links to all our Beachcomber news stories on our website. You can visit out of curiosity and stay for the visuals, especially for this next story, which is one of my favorites. In the early days of COVID, when people were figuring out how best to protect themselves and others, Reuters reported that an 82-year-old retired nurse in Cuba had taken matters into her own hands. PPE wasn't available, so she built her own protective covering. What does it look like? Imagine that you have a milk carton and it's big enough to step inside. And that's basically what she constructed. It's a flattering, knee-length, sleeveless milk carton. There's a cutout covered with plastic for her face. And she's also made the outside of the carton into a bit of a billboard for her thoughts. The video of her walking around making the rounds in her neighborhood is probably what you need to watch today. Sailing to the southeast, let's check in on Barbados, where it's reported that Queen Elizabeth II will be replaced as head of state, as the island is set to become a republic. Some would say Barbados already has a queen. Rihanna is from the island. Fans are definitely on board with having her reign, as the Twitterverse started suggesting as soon as the news about saying bye bye to the British monarchy was announced. And on the could happen front, news.com.au reports that in 2018, Rihanna was named, this is a mouthful, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary in Barbados. That is a role dedicated to promoting tourism, education, and investment in the country. A year earlier, the street she grew up on was also renamed Rihanna Drive. And since then, Rihanna has provided financial support to her homeland for infrastructure improvements and most recently for coronavirus relief aid. Barbados gets a lot of cruise ship traffic, or at least it did before the pandemic. In Singapore, the cruise industry is dipping a tentative toe back into the waters, launching a cruise to nowhere. The cruise simply sails into the ocean and then back again. No stops, just two days at sea. The ship could only carry half its usual capacity of passengers, meaning that the ratio of staff to passengers was nearly one to one. Of course, this all involves much quarantining, onboard testing with results available in 20 minutes, and pre-booking of everything everyone did. No buffets. Oh, and only available to Singapore residents. There's a different kind of empty in rural Japan as younger people continue moving to the cities to work and the aging population left behind is dwindling. One woman in the southern island of Shikoku wanted to fill that void, so Tsukimi Ayano made a scarecrow to keep birds away from her vegetable garden in a near-empty village. The scarecrow reminded her of her father, and that started her off on making more and more scarecrows until the village was nearly repopulated. The scarecrows are all around town now in different little vignettes. And whether you think it's poignant or creepy, it certainly is unusual. There's loads of pictures on the link on our website. Our next story is a bit of a reversal of an empty town so desperate for people that it's creating them. In Dingle, in County Kerry, Ireland, the whole town is searching for one creature. Fungi, a bottlenosed dolphin who has lived in the harbor for the last 37 years, happily visiting with folks and showing up whenever anyone wanted to play. But the last confirmed sighting was on October 13th, and hearts are breaking all around Ireland as hope slips away for his reappearance. But Fungi's legacy is the joy that he brought so many people. Meanwhile in Taiwan, Reuters reports that in August, a three-year-old girl went for the ride of a lifetime. Or maybe a flight of a lifetime. She was at a kite festival in Sinchu City in northern Taiwan when a particularly strong gust caused a kite tail to wrap around her waist like a big ribbon and carried her into the sky to a height of 30 meters, about 100 feet. 
A group of onlookers pitched in to pull the kite back under control and pull her back to the ground. The story doesn't say if she looks at this as her own moment out of the movie up, but fantastically, all she had was a few minor cuts. Also in August, three stranded sailors were rescued from a remote island in Micronesia after search crews spotted their SOS message written in the sand. The three-person crew of a skiff had not been heard from since July 29th and were reported missing two days later. The sailors were reportedly sailing a 23 nautical mile journey from Pulawat to Pulop atolls in the Federated States of Micronesia in the Western Pacific when they sailed off course and ran out of fuel. After a search by the Royal Australian Navy and U.S. Coast Guard, the men were found in good condition. That's good. On the French Mediterranean island of Corsica, Agence France Presse reports that there's a new kind of cat. Locals call them cat foxes, and they are about as cute as you are imagining right now. Wildlife rangers think this is a new undocumented species of cat, but no word yet if it likes lasagna. Lasagna? Well, that gives us an Italian connection to our next story. A couple from Venice, both flat earthers, thought they would sail to the edge of the earth, but instead they ended up in a COVID quarantine. They bought a boat in Sicily and set sail to go to the island of Lampedusa, which is located between Sicily and Tunisia. They believe it to be near the edge of the world. But they never got there. They ended up in Ustica, which is north of Sicily. A lockdown was in place at the time, and they were taken into quarantine. At first they tried to escape, but they were unsuccessful. When released, they abandoned their effort to sail to the edge of the world, and returned to mainland Italy. And finally, some more good news. If you were among the generations that read Lord of the Flies at school and figured, yeah, that's probably how it would go, well, there's news to show quite the opposite. Lord of the Flies was fiction, written by William Golding. Dutch historian Rutger Bregman has recently published a non-fiction book called Humankind, and one of the stories he reports in the book is about what happened in 1965 when a group of schoolboys were shipwrecked on an island near Tonga in the South Pacific. The six boys were students at a strict Catholic boarding school in Nuku Alofa, the capital of Tonga. And one day, sick of the lousy food and bored witless, they decided to borrow a boat from a fisherman none of them liked and head out for adventure. Their destination was Fiji, about 500 miles away, or even further on to New Zealand. And actually, adventure found them, and they wound up marooned on a small rocky islet until they were discovered by an alert Australian sea captain over a year later. Here's a little taste from Bregman's book of what the captain found when he landed on their island. Captain Warner wrote in his memoirs, the boys had set up a small commune with food garden, hollowed out tree trunks to store rainwater, a gymnasium with curious weights, a badminton court, chicken pens, and a permanent fire, all from handiwork, an old knife blade, and much determination. While the boys in Lord of the Flies came to blows over the fire, those in this real-life version tended their flames so that it never went out for more than a year. I love it. Even the story after their rescue is full of surprises. So do your heart a favor, go to our website and follow the link for the entire story. And now another special archipelago segment, Beached, episodes that couldn't set sail. Early on, when we were developing Island Watch, we thought, how about we include some TV shows? Maybe they're not island-based, but they had episodes that were set on islands. So we watched a few, mostly out of nostalgia. We had, we had some laughs doing it. Dave, one of the shows you were interested in was The Brady Bunch. Lots of people remember the opening theme with the lovely lady and her lovely girls meeting the busy man with three boys of his own. You somehow remembered that there had been a Hawaiian trilogy and you watched it. How did that turn out? Well, it's a mixed bag. First, though, I've got a confession. When I was a kid, I loved the Brady Bunch. Okay, I was a kid. The first three episodes of season four comprise the Hawaii trilogy. 
the blended family members get to go for a vacation to Oahu. Now, what it does have going for it, it was actually shot in the state. They showcase a number of the island's physical features like Diamond Head, Pearl Harbor, and Waikiki, as well as historical monuments such as the USS Arizona Memorial and the statue of King Kamehameha. And there's even a cameo by entertainer Don Ho. There are hula dances, surfing, and a luau. What's wrong with it? Well, it's kind of a cliched presentation of Hawaiian indigenous traditions and reliance on stereotypes. Bobby, the youngest son, finds a small statue which he's told is taboo. Then bad things begin to happen to the family. But not really bad, because this is a 70s family sitcom, of course. Honest, Dad. It's a real terrible taboo. Oh, honey, that's just a story from a superstitious old gentleman. Then how do you explain all the awful things that have been happening to us since we found it? Very simply, coincidence. I mean, Greg gets wiped out by a wave, Alice hurts her back, a, a spider crawls across the room. Coincidence. That's all. None of that happened because of some ancient taboo. Of course. But that little statue only has the power that you imagine it to have. Sure. Take it home and show it to your friends. I'll get a kick out of it. <laughs> but the boys decide they must break the curse, and hilarity ensues as the boys try to return this token to a burial ground of ancient kings. And they even get menaced by Vincent Price. Ooh, scary. Yes, it's pretty standard 70s sitcom stuff. While it merits some plaudits for showcasing the island state, I think it sort of comes up short in being accurate and respectful of indigenous traditions, and it even seems to condone the theft of archaeological artifacts. It doesn't really feel like a plausible candidate for island watching. Indulging our nostalgia is fun for a short bit, but like we found with Gilligan's Island, too, a little taste is usually enough. I know that you were interested in The Six Million Dollar Man, too. Let's see, that series ran from 1973 to 1978, and it was about a NASA astronaut who is rebuilt after a terrible crash, and the cost of rebuilding him is six million dollars, or adjusted for inflation, about 35 million dollars today. His right arm, both legs, and his left eye are replaced with bionic implants, and that means he can run at a speed of 100 kilometers an hour. His eye is effectively a zoom lens, and his bionic limbs give him the strength of a bulldozer. Plus, everything he does is in slow motion with super cool sound effects that kids on playgrounds everywhere were trying to imitate. So we watched Season 1, Episode 2, Survival of the Fittest. Now I must admit, this was another favorite series of mine when I was growing up. And in this episode, our bionic man of action, Steve Austin, he's traveling with his boss, Oscar Goldman, following some sensitive negotiations with the Russians. They take a military flight back to Washington, but the plane crashes at sea near the shore of an uncharted island and among the other survivors are assassins who are determined to take out Oscar. Well, what's it got going for it? Not much. It's pretty standard 70s TV action stuff, and it's kind of short on real action, suspense, and characterization. What's wrong with it? Well, first, it's not made clear where Steve and Oscar are traveling from. It looks like they leave California or somewhere in the western U.S., but they're flying east to Washington. Why would they be over the ocean? Even if they're leaving from Hawaii, there are no islands between Hawaii and the Channel Islands of California, so the whole premise strains credibility. And the island just doesn't feel like an island. The topography, the vegetation, the wildlife, it's pretty obvious that it was shot on the coast of California. So we sailed right by this show. Yeah, so true. In the end, we decided that TV shows with island one-offs weren't really the direction we wanted, so we left those episodes beached and we kept on looking. Next, we surfed through movies, looking for shows that would give us the feeling of being on an island and also have something specific to say about the place. One movie we tried was a 1963 screwball romantic comedy called Move Over Darling, starring Doris Day and James Garner. 
It's about a woman who returns after being rescued from a deserted island where she was stranded for five years, only to discover she's just been declared legally dead and her husband is getting remarried. We thought it might be an interesting counterpoint to Castaway. What happens when somebody returns after so long on a deserted island? Lord Ellen, what happened? We searched for you, we looked for you. How did you? Nikki, I can't tell you about five years in two seconds, darling. <laughs> Besides, you have much more to tell me. You know about Bianca. Oh, Nikki, how could you? How could I? The minute my back was turned. The minute? Oh, I thought you loved me. All those years. You I... know I love you. Oh, Nikki. The island is never shown and barely mentioned. What might have been a more in-depth character study about someone who has to adjust to her old life after such a long gap, and also those who were left behind who had to move on with their lives, Instead, we have a mildly entertaining comedy of manners that is very much of its time, but it's an island that we sailed right past. Pretty representative of some other movies that we left beached. And on the flip side of those movies that couldn't hold our attention, movies that we loved but just didn't have enough of an island feel to feature as an island watch. So I'm really glad we're doing this segment because it gives me a chance to talk about a couple of movies that I give a five out of five recommendation reading, which means stop whatever you're binging and watch this now. These are both movies I'll rewatch over the holidays because they're just that good. They, they bring me joy and tears and happiness. Your first pick is Hunt for the Wilder People, a 2016 film directed by Taika Waititi, whom we first met back in our Moana episode earlier this season. He wrote the initial screenplay for Moana, and he wrote the screenplay for this movie too. That's right. I trust his track record. Hunt for the Wilder People is one of those rare PG-13 movies that everyone in the whole family can genuinely enjoy. To be clear, we would have included it as an Island Watch episode except for one thing. Though it is indisputably set in New Zealand, you never see the coast, there's no real sense of being on an island. The scenery, though, being New Zealand, is gorgeous. Here's a scene where the two main characters, young Ricky and his uncle Hector, are on a promontory overlooking a lake. Pretty majestical, eh? I don't think that's a word. Majestical? Sure it is. Nah, it's not real. What would you know? It's majestic. Oh, it doesn't sound very special. Majestical's way better. What do you reckon this place is called anyway? Do you think it's that place where the cloak gets wet by the sky or something? I don't know. What the hell does that mean? Auntie Bella said she was from up here. From this special lake that almost touches the sky. This film is full of beauty. And right beside it, the kind of goofy adventures that I craved as a kid. For example... Ricky has run away to the forest, and his adversary, Paula, played by Rachel House, who incidentally also played Tella, Moana's grandmother, she spots Ricky across a ravine, and she tries to persuade him to come back to civilization with her, very much not part of Ricky's plan. I'll never stop running. Yeah, and I'll never stop chasing you. I'm relentless. I'm like the Terminator. I'm more like Terminator than you. I said at first, you're more like Sarah Connor. No, I'm not. Yes, in, in the first movie too, before she could do chin-ups. I noticed the other day that the rating on Netflix was two stars out of five. Do not fall for that. Rotten Tomatoes gives Hunt for the Wilder People a 97% fresh rating. I admired the acting, especially the performances of the two leads, Julian Dennison as Ricky and Sam Neill as the crusty Hector, that really made the movie. The film exuded an atmosphere of the great outdoors, but you're right, it was not necessarily an island aura. Now you mentioned that there were two movies you wanted to recommend. What's the other one? Have you heard of the show My Octopus Teacher? Yeah, my wife and I watched it on Netflix. It was very compelling. Right? I mean, first... That title is so much fun <laughs> because it's so ambiguous. Is someone teaching my octopus or is the octopus teaching me? 
And the only reason we didn't include this show is because it's not set on an island. It's set on the South African coast near Cape Town. This place on the tip of Africa is known as the Cape of Storms. My childhood memories are completely dominated by the rocky shore, the intertidal, and the kelp forest. We had this little wooden bungalow, literally below the high water mark. So when those huge storms used to come in, the, the ocean used to smash the doors down and fill up the bottom of the house. So it was incredibly exciting as a child to literally live in the force of that giant Atlantic Ocean. The boy grows into a real man named Craig Foster, who is a very talented photographer. He does all the handheld in-ocean camera work, and his friend, Roger Horrocks, one of the top wildlife cinematographers in the world, does the big camera astounding shots of the ocean. This film is visually so good that I've actually rewatched it with the sound off. It's a lot like immersing yourself in a dream. Everything seems so real and so vivid, and yet you're sort of floating in a way. It's dramatic, yet it's still very calming and engrossing. I would tell you more about the story, except that this is one of those films I think it's best experienced with no real expectations. I mean, I've built up your expectations now, but I, I don't think I'm going to tell you anything about the story. I think just jump into the waters, get carried away by it, and come back to Island Watch for a full refund if you don't think it's very, very good. And now, time for messages in a bottle. In a time when it seems everything is virtual, we have real messages from listeners. Did they arrive in bottles? Not exactly. But we don't love mail any less, even if it comes through standard channels. You can always write us at islandwatchpodcast at gmail.com or contact us on Twitter at islandwatchcast. Our first letter is from Betty, who writes, I love Island Watch. I've recommended it to my friend. I subscribe to your podcast so it downloads automatically. I love the format. It's educational, but not in your face. I love the casual conversation and the chemistry between the two of you. Your voices are very calming and soothing. I do feel like I'm on vacation when I listen to the podcast. Thanks a lot, Betty. We appreciate your spreading the good word about Island Watch. We have another letter. This one is from Candy. Dear Gemma and Dave, I'm absolutely loving your Island Watch podcast. I find it soothing to listen to, entertaining, and informative. My husband and I particularly enjoyed the episode, The Grand Seduction, as St. John's is a place where he has recently moved to for work, and we were reading up on Newfoundland prior to his move, so we were ecstatic to see that the movie took place on that island. I agree with Gemma that there could have been more scenic views in the movie, otherwise it was a great movie that my husband and I watched together. I've recently listened to your Castaway and Moana episodes, actually a few times now, as I don't even need to watch the movie to enjoy these podcasts. But they are on my list to watch, and I do look forward to it. Well, glad we could help with the move, Candy. Maybe your husband can update us on more East Coast movies that he comes across during his time on The Rock. Thanks for your letter. And now a short note from listener Suzanne, who is interested in all things Australian. And Suzanne writes, I listened to Izzy's Koala World and loved it in many ways. I was listening while walking and logged 5,000 steps as a bonus. Thank you. Listening to Island Watch while exercising. Brilliant move. Thanks for your message, Suzanne. Here's an email from listener Michael in Germany. Michael writes, I've been listening to podcasts for many years, and some might call me a podcast snob, so it's very hard for a podcast to make it into my regular playlist. Island Watch is one of those rare gems that won me over with Dave and Gemma's informed and engaging storytelling. 
I love the concept to travel virtually through the lens of movies and TV shows, sharing insightful perspectives along the way. Can't wait for the next episode. Making it into someone's regular playlist is an honor for us. Thanks, Michelle. And here's some feedback we've received from iTunes reviews. Debriefer comments, They bring the right balance of fun, quirky, and smart. Looking forward to see what other islands they visit. RBW63 writes, The show is well-researched, and I enjoy the dialogue between the hosts. Let us know how you like to listen to Island Watch, whether it's exercising, curling up on the couch with a cup of tea, cleaning your boat, or whatever. One of our goals here is to make your day go by that much more smoothly and to give you a mental vacation whenever you press play. And here's our special archipelago segment, Island Chef. Five months ago, my fantasy became reality in a form seldom seen before, a podcast with an online collection of picnic suggestions. The motivation in creating Island Watch picnic picks, focusing on island dishes, was to try dishes never tasted before, create menus of munchies completely customized to each film and TV show we watch, and to flex my artistic muscles in championing a truly kick-ass collection of movie snackages. On a in case you've missed it, we wanted to highlight picnic picks from this season's episodes. To get the full menu for each episode, check out islandwatchpodcast.com. So, where do we start, Gemma? Let's start at the very beginning. A very good place to start. The Gilligan's Island episode. You got it. The professor makes a putty to hold together the raft Gilligan and Skipper build to attempt a rescue mission. So, I took his basic formula and I turned it into putty a la professor. The professor's special raft building mix is made of mashed mango and berries and you can blend your own by splashing in some coconut water with mango and berries and taking it for a whirl in your blender i would try that gilligan did another drink that showed up in picnic picks was in episode two castaway that's right coconut water in one of his solo castaway rambles, Chuck calls out Gilligan for not sharing the information that coconut water can have a laxative effect. And it's sort of true. Coconut water straight from the coconut is about 11% fiber, even though it looks clear. The menu for castaway was pretty limited, though, because he's just eating what he can find on the island. But once we went to Newfoundland for episode 3, The Grand Seduction, the menu expanded. It was very eclectic. Everything from Newfoundland-produced purity cream crackers to the doctor's craving lamb dansack. And episode four, Moana, brought even more variety in a menu I think would be a lot of fun to make during the holidays because there are so many textures and special touches. You mean the shiny treats like gold-dusted meringues and sugared cranberries? Yes, that was my homage to Tamatoa, the big sparkly crab monster in Moana. But besides shiny things, I also posted a recipe for chocolate lava cakes, you know, to go with the drama at the end of the movie. Or you could go for a super trendy island cake. It's all the rage right now, complete with a turquoise jello sea. It's a huge amount of work, but it will keep your Instagram fed. I'd particularly like to try those lava cakes. We did our first mini-episode, Izzy's Koala World. Right, and because it was a mini-episode, I just did a mini-menu. It's just Aussie burgers, you know, topped with pickled beets and fried eggs, and for an alternate offering, a eucalyptus mukbang. What exactly is a mukbang, anyway? A mukbang started in Korea via YouTube. It's basically a video where you watch people eating, and some of the videos are fascinating, and others are, are just plain gross. But I was just playing with the idea of mukbang because really the link is to a live feed of a koala bear sanctuary. And it's, it's so peaceful watching koalas just slowly chew their way through their eucalyptus. Agreed. And then let's see, our next episode was Kiribati, A Drowning Paradise. 
That was our documentary pick for the season. And I knew nothing about Kiribati before this episode, and now I, I feel a connection with it. Food is a great way to grow a connection, so I wanted to give people a couple of options. You can go simple with a soothing pumpkin soup that was featured in the documentary as part of a traditional foods class, or you can go do a deeper dive into an entire Kiribati menu. That might actually make a really interesting holiday project. The Majorca Files was episode number six, but you didn't stick with just Spanish recipes, did you? I mean, Spanish food. There are so many delicious dishes to choose from, but... Because I tailor the menu to the show, that meant including dishes to give a nod to the two main characters, Miranda, the British detective, and Max, her German counterpart. Paying tribute to food grown on Mallorca was important to me, so I chose a Spanish almond cake recipe that I found. It's from Claudia Rodin, who is a hugely respected cookbook author and cultural anthropologist, and it's delicious, the kind you can really sink into and savor. Sounds good. And definitely more decadent than anything in our next episode, which was Small Island, set mainly in post-war England. Yeah, definitely people would have been hungry for indulgence, if not just plain hungry. But the Jamaican side of the equation for this picnic is full of rich tastes like stop-and-go fish fritters, there's bulla cakes, which are slightly sweet quick breads made with grated ginger, and then you eat them topped with avocado or slices of cheese. I mean, come on, how can you go wrong? <laughs> and then satisfying sweets like peanut drops, which would be perfect for holiday giving. And one of my favorites, tamarind balls. I, I've never made them with rum before, but the recipe I posted suggests giving that a go. And hey, happy holidays, why not? If you do want English food, the fish and chips recipe video that Gemma posted is from Darren McGrady, a former chef to the British royalty, and he walks through the entire process of fish and chips, whether you want to make them traditional style as the staff preferred, or in the style that the Queen likes. Spoiler, all her chips must be of identical length. Fish and chip shops exist for a reason. That's all I have to say. Anyway, let us know if you try any of our picnic picks and how they work out for you. And if you have suggestions to add to our menus to date, please send them in. We'd love to hear from you. And now, a musical note. One of the things that we feel makes our podcast really special is our music, which was composed by Ted Gibbons. And we took a little time to ask him a few questions about his process in coming up with our theme. We reached out to him on Zoom. Good morning, Ted. How are you doing? Uh, good morning, Dave. I'm doing fine. How are you? Very well, thanks. We're here doing our season one wrap up and we wanted to have a big shout out to you for doing our music because we feel it's such an integral part of the show that it really helps to set the mood for the episode and really helps to keep that tone going throughout. So I wanted to ask you, when we commissioned you to do the music, was there anything in particular that inspired you to come up with this particular tune or how did you go about that? That's a really good question because it was a bit scatterbrained when I was, you guys asked me to do this, which I was very uh, proud to do. It was a lot of fun. I had many ideas. We were looking for something kind of light and bouncy. I think I even named the file light and bouncy. <laughs> <laughs> so as you know, I had, I had offered you a few samples of, of tunes and music and that kind of thing. And I'd been thinking about different ideas. But one of the ideas I thought was this had to be kind of a happy and, and light, like, you know, like we were talking about, kind of light and everything. And a piece that I had worked on earlier, but not not really, just sort of a snippet of a piece of music I had worked on a few years ago. And I had my granddaughter in mind, who is as light and bouncy as it gets. And, and so one of the pieces I offered you was a rework of that. In fact, that was the workup period, because all I had was a little snippet of an idea. And I spent a long time actually kind of working that through. I was thinking of a, a definite form, what's called an AABA form, 
which is something that came out of the 20s, 30s, and 40s, and the whole jazz thing hit. So I worked it up, and it was really cool. And I sent that in as part of the offering that I sent you folks. And um, I was kind of hoping in the background that you would pick that one. And sure enough, when you picked it, I thought, yeah, you got a little bit of my granddaughter in there. <laughs> and it seemed to fit, right? I, I think the, what you, you, you were looking for. That's really great, Ted, because it really did hit the spot. We were still working on the design of the show at the time that you were doing the music. And when you sent us those pieces and we picked that one, it really helped us have a better sense in our, in our heads about how the show would sound and feel because we had this music to energize us as we approached the, the initial episodes. And we were really grateful to have that from before we actually started recording the initial episodes so that we could hopefully match that delightful tone that, that you suggested in your composition. Well, thank you for joining us today, Ted. Yeah, my great pleasure. to catch up with you, and we really appreciate what you've done for us. We feel it's really helped to set the tone for our show, and it's part of the fun that we look forward to every time we record and edit an episode. With so many islands in the world, it's challenging to figure out which to visit. That's why we created the Find the Island segment, to learn more about or even discover islands that are new to us. Maybe it will help choose which islands to visit, either in person or on a future episode of Island Watch. Here's how to play. One of us gives a series of clues about an island, and the other tries to work out what island it is. Best of all, you can play along at home. And today, because we're doing things with a little extra, we're going to feature two islands. Gemma, I'm ready if you've got the clues. All right. Today's island is a desert. There's minimal rain and the air is dry. However, in the last few years, the temperatures have been going up and the climate is getting wetter. That's pretty general. I don't think I know just yet. I'll fill you in on the folks who live there. The population ranges between 2,500 and 3,000 people, depending on the season. And they have a tradition of taking off their shoes at the entrance of homes and offices and wearing slippers from there on in. Okay, yeah, that doesn't sound familiar yet, but I, can, I wonder if it's because maybe there's lots of sand on their feet, so that's why they take off their shoes? Maybe. I made this one a little bit more challenging, I think. <laughs> okay. Life is more of a straight line than a circle here. No one is allowed to give birth on the island, and once you die, you can't be buried on the island. Okay, Inter interesting. I remember last episode you liked places that were sort of oddities, so this is one of those. This certainly sounds like it is an oddity. Anyone can live on this island. It's an entirely visa-free zone. Wow, that's interesting. I mean, I can't imagine that there are too many places on the planet that are like that. There are not. And this island has just a handful of settlements, not really towns or cities, settlements. You can't use a firearm in the settlements, but a 2012 law requires anyone traveling outside the settlements to carry a gun. Sorry, just to clarify, it requires you to carry one? It doesn't forbid you? You can't have it in town. In fact, in shops and offices, there's often lockers where you'll put your gun. But if you're leaving town, you have to have a gun with you. Okay, that's really interesting. I'm not quite sure, but I might have an idea. Just any more clues? Well, this one is probably going to help you narrow it in. The reason you probably want to have that gun, well, not just you probably want to have it, it's required by law, is that there are more polar bears on this island than there are people. Okay, I think I know what it is. Is it Svalbard? It is. Svalbard is an island that belongs to Norway, but it's not near the Norwegian mainland. It's about halfway between Norway and the North Pole. And Longyearbyen, as in it's been a long year, Longyearbyen is the largest settlement and it's also the island's administrative center. There are so many fascinating things about this island, including the final clue I had, which I thought might, might give it to you if the polar bears didn't, is 
There's a global seed vault built into the bedrock above Longyearbyen Airport. There's almost a million seed samples from all over the world stored in there. Yes, I have heard of the global seed vault. Yeah, I, I'd heard of it, but I didn't really know where it was. But that, that's where it is. So the, the settlements actually, well, settlement on the island started in the 17th and 18th century as whaling bases, but then those were abandoned. And then beginning of the 20th century, coal started, coal mining. And that's the reason people take off their shoes. That was a bit of a red herring because people were probably thinking, oh, maybe somewhere in Japan, but nope. It's the miners used to take off their shoes so that they wouldn't track coal dust into the houses because that makes a huge mess and is really hard to clean. So right now, the main drivers of the economy are coal mining, tourism, and research. And people living there live in housing that is owned by the various employers and institutions who rent, who then rent to their employees. So there's very few privately owned houses. And because of that, it's nearly impossible to live on Svalbard without working for an established institution. And then the bit about not being allowed to give birth or to be buried there. A few weeks before uh, you're due, you are flown to the mainland and that's where you uh, give birth because there's no proper uh, hospitals there. And as far as being buried, they found that if people are buried in the permafrost, it preserves the bodies a little too well. So if there's any sort of infectious problems that actually in the past had killed other people. So that's why there's no burials allowed on the island now. It sounds like it's kind of an extreme place in terms of the climate. And it may be very challenging to live there. But it might be an interesting place to go to, to visit. You said that tourism is one of the main drivers these days. Perhaps not in 2020 because of COVID, but it might be an interesting place to visit. I'm adding it to my list. Okay, Dave, what do you have up your sleeve today for a find the island? Well, when is an island not an island? This island doesn't really exist anymore. Well, okay, at least not in the form that it did a century ago. I see what you're doing. I made yours challenging and you're going to pay it right back. <laughs> okay. No idea. Yes, this one I think is a bit challenging. At the beginning of the 20th century, this small island was about 60 acres in size. Not very big. And it had a freshwater lake on it. And it was known as an important breeding ground and nesting ground for water birds. Mm, nope. Now, I mentioned the bird population. A lot of birds were being slaughtered for their feathers. This was early in the 20th century. So in 1905, at the urging of the Audubon Society, President Theodore Roosevelt designated the island as a national wildlife refuge, and that ensured a safe place for the birds to continue to use the island. Well, well done creating a refuge, but I still don't have any idea where we're talking about. Okay, here's another clue. In 1921, so just about 100 years ago, a hurricane with winds exceeding 160 kilometers per hour decimated the island. The winds and waves obliterated the freshwater lake and most of the vegetation. I don't like where this is heading. It doesn't sound good. Well, fast forward again. Hurricanes in 2004 and, and 2005, the island was almost completely washed away. But since 2014, it has reappeared. Well, Sometimes it has a little more than just a sandbar. Okay, so I'm going to guess that this is an island somewhere uh, off the coast of the U.S. Yes. That's my guess. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's all I've got. Okay. It is a difficult one, and I, and I did make this one kind of challenging. It's called Passage Key. It's located in Tampa Bay off Manatee County in Florida. Okay, my takeaway for this is that there's a place called Manatee County. I love that. <laughs> yes, Manatee County. What caught my attention about this place is the sort of ephemeral nature of the island. Its existence depends on currents, winds, and storms. Its designation as the Passage Key National Wildlife Refuge continues to this day. It's still an important part of the ecosystem for birds. According to one 2017 article I found, there are often sightings of laughing gulls, royal terns, black skimmers, sandwich terns, brown pelicans, American oyster catchers, sanderlings, cormorants, and dowagers. 
Now the island, such as it is, is off limits to visitors. Nonetheless, it's a popular destination for boaters. There can be up to 300 boats in the area on weekends or holidays. And it's apparently particularly popular with nudists. Now, people can approach only as far as the high water line. If you venture closer than that, you could be fined by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. But part of the attraction is that in the surrounding waters, there's reportedly excellent snorkeling, where you can spot many fish and dolphins and even manatees. Yay, manatees! But it's this interesting island slash not quite an island, and that's what fascinated me about it. Well, that was our first archipelago episode. What a party! Yes, indeed. Quite the trip. Before we head out, we'd like to say if you have a show you'd like us to review, or if you have an island you'd like us to feature on Island Watch, send your suggestions to islandwatchpodcast at gmail.com or islandwatchcast on Twitter. We'd love your input. Because for most of December, we're going to be tucked away in the island workshop handcrafting our second season, which will premiere in January 2021. We'll be busy mending our sails and scraping the barnacles off the ship's hull. In the meantime, we'd like to say thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your feedback. And thank you for being part of this grand adventure. We'll see you in January. Fair winds and calm seas. This has been a production of Phosphine League. Phosphine League. Phosphine League. Phosphine League. That hurts my brain too much, I think. Yeah, urgency is what this is about. Um... I forgot my thoughts. Uh, What did you say? It's something about urgency and something else. Well, I found this a delightful series. It was, it was, it was good. Uh, Sorry, uh, sorry, (laughs) sorry, my my, my brain freeze there. Doesn't sound doesn't sound quite right without the music already playing, but if you can, the, the, the music will be there. It will sound good. Ding 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 Okay. Oh. Oh. I did. Okay. Sorry. Let let let's let's do that. I'm gonna do that one again. Okay. Okay. I was asleep at the wheel, literally. Well, it's okay. Yeah. Okay. I think I can live with that. Okay. All right. Cool. Da 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 da. And ding, 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 and we're out. Okay, that, shall we stop, right? Yes, let's hit okay. stop.